Welcome to part two of our lecture on chapter 10 on abilities testing. In part one of our lecture, we focus particularly on academic aptitude tests. And in this second part of our chapter 10 lecture, we're really gonna focus on academic achievement tests. So to start, I really want to emphasize that a big part of achievement testing in academic settings comes in the form of graduate and professional school admissions tests. So I hope that many of you were spared from this because I know the MAC program has dropped the GRE requirement, but one of the most common graduate school admission tests is the graduate record examination or the GRE. And the second is the Miller Analogies test. These are the two most common academic achievement aptitude tests that are used to determine admission into graduate and professional schools. So the GRE general test includes three different sessions or sections, the verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and analytical writing sections. The test is completed in just under four hours. It's about three hours and 55 minutes once you count the breaks. And scores for the, the revised GRE range from 130 to 170 for the verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning sections. And the analytical writing section is scored on a, one, on a zero to six point scale. There are optional subject tests for the GRE depending on the graduate school recommendations and requirements. So there's one for psychology, but not all graduate schools in psychology require that you take a subject test. Um, but they do exist should your school require it. And typically the GRE is administered in testing centers by trained testers or assessors. So at least in the experience that I've heard of from other people who have taken it as well as myself, you go in and you might be one of two or three people in a room taking the test and the entire time you're on camera from multiple different angles there's microphones everywhere you actually have to go through a metal detector and you're not, if you wear long sleeves or long pants you have to pull up your pant legs and your shirt sleeves so they can make sure that you're not cheating you're not allowed to take a water bottle in the room with you if you want to take a drink of water you have to leave the room go to a locker get a drink and then come back so it's a really high testing like high stress testing situation and the GRE is used to, used to at least have what's called like a graduated difficulty where depending on how well you were doing on the test, if you were getting a lot of questions right, the GRE was automatically slated to provide you with increased difficulty questions. And this really increased the efficiency and accuracy of scoring because participants were scored both on the number of questions that they answered correctly, as well as the difficulty of their questions. But unfortunately, the testing commissions reverted back to a more randomized format of questions because test takers would memorize their answers from previous test takers or testing sessions, and it was swaying the results on the GRE. The GRE scores tend to predict success in graduate school, but it's not that great of a predictor for a number of different reasons. One, there is likely to be a problem of restriction of range within particular departments. Because the GREs and undergraduate GPAs are the major criteria on which students are selected for graduate programs, you eliminate low scores automatically. And the GRE is still considered a valid predictor of graduate GPA, even with this restriction of range, but it's most predictive when it's combined with undergraduate GPA to make a prediction of how well someone will do in graduate school. The second reason why the GRE is not the best, not the best valid test of academic achievement is because a lot of GRE scores are heavily influenced by your access to testing or to study materials. So if you can afford to take a course on studying for the GRE or can afford the testing materials, whether that's the book, the note cards or whatever it is, that is probably going to be one of the bigger indicators of how well you're going to do on the GRE, which eliminates an entire plethora of people who cannot afford the study materials. The second graduate and professional school admissions test that's really popular is the Miller Analogies test, which is a 120 item test of analogies of increasing difficulty that are used to detect higher levels of cognitive ability. 
The entire test, as I mentioned, is only 120 items. Of those 120 items, 100 of them are scored and 20 of them are experimental items that the Commission for Miller Analogies test is thinking about adding to their testing set. Overall, the Miller Analogies test takes about 60 minutes to complete, so it's a significantly shorter test compared to the GRE. And research shows that the Miller Analogies test was a valid predictor of graduate school grades and time to finish graduate degree in addition to vocational and career criteria. So how well someone, how likely someone was to find a career after graduation. There are more specialized tests that are used by professional schools. Some of these include the law school admissions test or the LSAT, the medical college admissions test or the MCAT, there's the dental admissions test or the DAT, as well as the graduate manage, management admissions test or the GMAT. And these tests are typically more expansive or expensive to take than the GRE or the Miller's Analogy test because they are very specific to these professional schools. And the skills that are being assessed in each of these specialized tests will vary depending on the professional school. So for example, the dental admission school test has a test of dexterity because you're holding instruments in your hands where that might not be necessary for the law school admissions test. There are several achievement tests that are commonly used in high school levels as well, specifically from kindergarten through 12th grade settings. And a lot of those include the Iowa assessments, which includes next generation Iowa assessments and the Iowa early learning inventory, as well as the Stanford achievement test or the Stanford 10 and the Metropolitan Achievement Test 8th edition, as well as the Terra Nova test. So all of these tests are commonly used to measure student learning and progress in school subjects, such as reading, language, mathematics, science, and social studies. And these tests are oftentimes used in a diagnostic way to identify the strengths and weaknesses of a specific skill and achievements in individual students. As a result of the diagnoses that come out of these tests, students can be selected for specific types of instruction, either remedial or advanced in nature. So two achievement tests have been used as well to award college credit to individuals without them actually enrolling in college. And those are the college level examination program and the advanced placement program. So the college level ed examination program assesses students' knowledge of content that is commonly covered in introductory courses that are taught during the first two years of an undergraduate degree. And students who take the college level examination program and pass with a satisfactory score can earn between three and 12 credits towards their degree, depending on the college that they are attending and the college's requirements around how many credits they can earn out of that test. And the advanced placement program is one that provides materials and examinations for college level courses that can be offered in secondary schools or in high schools for which students can then earn college credit and obtain advanced placement in college courses. So being able to transfer college credits to your undergrad university, but taking them at a lower cost because they're offered at your school or through your high school so that you don't have to pay the tuition once you get into college. Another academic achievement test that's common at the college level is the test of English as a foreign language or the TOEFL, which is widely used as an admissions requirement for international students wanting to attend a United States college or university. And the test, can test, the test consists of four sections, listening, speaking, reading, and a written essay. And all four of these sections have been identified as the necessary skills for success in the U.S. education system. There are additional academic aptitude tests that have been developed to assess general adult education achievement. And those include tests of adult basic in education, the adult basic learning examination, and the basic achievement skills inventory. 
Typically, reading, mathematics, and language ability are assessed in all of these categories, and it's really just determining if a client wants these, how to get them access to these tests. These achievement tests tend to be offered by testing facilities and not necessarily by independent assessing facilities. So something like an education testing center will typically offer, offer these. And there are other individual achievement tests that can be used across the lifespan to assess reading, mathematics, and language skills. These include the Wide Range Achievement Test, which is in its fourth edition, the Kaufman Test of Educational Achievement, and the Wexler Individual Achievement Test, third edition. It really just sort of varies on the client if it's important to have these assessments available to them or at least know how to refer them, refer these clients to testing centers for them. It's really very unique depending on the client because not everyone needs to know what their academic achievement is as an adult unless their job requires it. And although there is a contro although it's a controversial process at this time, achievement testing is often used to indicate both the quality of student learning as well as the quality of instruction in a particular school or a state. And we call this high stakes testing. So testing that's used to determine how well the students are learning, how well the teachers are doing in conveying information and teaching the students. And we call it high stakes testing largely because results from these tests oftentimes are used as a change agent to improve instruction and learning at different institutions, especially at elementary, middle, and high school levels. So one purpose of high, take, high stakes testing is to ensure that students are not left behind in learning in order to promote equitable education access across schools within a particular state. There is a specific act called the Every Student Succeeds Act or the ESA in, in legislation that guides high stakes testing today. It is a reauthorization of the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And the assumption of Every Student Succeeds Act is that increased demands on schools and states will increase student and school performance. So if schools know that there is pressure for the students to perform in assumption, then the students will do better. Teachers will do better and students will do better. And what we found is that a lot of times the ESA requires annual statewide assessments of student learning with state-driven performance targets and measures. So there are these really strict standards to say, okay, your students need to perform at this level in order to gain access to these resources or to do well or to be considered okay. And ESA provides more flexibility in two states in measuring student success as well as identifying high quality teachers and promoting principals professional development. Student level interventions oftentimes can apply to the bottom 5% of schools and schools with high dropout rates or schools with subgroups who are falling behind. So the state uses these high, high stakes testing situations and high, high stakes testing results to determine which schools and which students and which groups of students at schools need additional resources, funding, or programs in order to ensure that, again, these students are not left behind. And although high stakes testing may be favorably viewed as focusing instruction, teaching may, however, become mechanized and ignoring individual student ways of achievement as well as teacher creativity can be sort of the downsides to this high stakes testing. Also, scholars have argued that students of color and students from disadvantaged backgrounds are negatively affected by accountability legislation such as ESA. So we have to use careful attention, especially in these communities, around the interpretation and use of high stakes testing. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about study habits inventories because they can be useful in the context of work that you do as a clinician in the community, particularly for high school and college students whose study habits 
are compared to their peers not what you would expect especially when students are having difficulties with their co coursework or are not achieving academically to their potential study habits inventories can be useful to compare how well the child the student is doing in comparison to their same age peers and the study habits inventories serve as instructional tools for counselors to use with students or for identifying student challenges and strategizing for improvement. Common study habit inventories include the student abilities and methods survey, the college student inventory, the learning and study strategies inventory, and several tools labeled as the learning styles inventory, as well as the thinking styles inventory. In addition to the diagnostic purposes of study habits inventories, these inventories also act as structured exercises that can help teach good study techniques and point out ineffective attitudes and behaviors. So if you're working with younger students or younger clients and you're noticing that they're academically underachieving compared to their abilities or they're just underachieving compared to their peers, study habits inventories can serve as both an assessment and an intervention in providing these students with the support that they need for you as a counselor. And that is where we are going to wrap up our lecture on chapter 10. As always, here are the questions to help you review this chapter to make sure that you are covering the most important aspects of this chapter. And I will see you all in the next lecture.